Well, NASA has started the process of opening and removing the asteroid samples from a canister, Osiris Rex, for the first time in more than seven years. Joining me now live is astrophysicist and cosmologist at ANU, Brad Tucker. Brad, thank you so much for joining us as always. So the lid has quite literally been lifted. What exactly did it reveal? Exactly. So, you know, we saw these samples land early Monday morning our time, um, and now they've been essentially this process of unveiling them. Because the way it worked is um, the touch-and-go um, system that you're kind of seeing here now acted almost like, a, like an air filter on a car and sucked up and contained all those samples. That was then sealed into a larger container, which is kind of what people saw land on Monday morning and descending to the Earth, as you see now. And so when they opened that outer container, they actually started to already see dust and pebbles and rock from the asteroid. Uh, and this is because when they did this initial maneuver, they essentially scooped up so much that they actually had a problem closing the lid. Now, eventually they got it there, but there was clearly a bit of rock and dust spilt in this outer capsule, that one that was just pictured there, that they're already able to glimpse. So it's already an exciting process because one of the questions always with these things is, how many samples do you get? Well, clearly they got tons of them. So now that they've removed those kind of outer samples, and then we'll slowly start the process of carefully removing some of the inner samples, the idea being they want to keep most of them preserved uh, because in the future we'll have new experiments or measurements that we want to do. And as soon as you expose it to Earth, essentially, it can be contaminated. So we want to keep as many preserved for as long as possible. So they want to keep it preserved then. So what, what will they hope to find out, essentially? Yeah, look, uh, the two big questions really are, what is the density and composition of this asteroid? Um, Bennu, which it visited, is a type of asteroid, an Apollo asteroid, that crosses the path of Earth regularly. These are the class of asteroids, generally speaking, that we worry about, the ones that come near the Earth. So by understanding exactly what it's made up of, densities, compositions, those sorts of things, you can plan how to build a mission to deflect uh, or alter it if one was ever headed for Earth. And then the other idea is if some of these materials um, contained on the asteroid actually contain things like amino acids. We've seen on another asteroid mission to Rigu, which was done by the Hayabusa 2 probe, um, which Australia was involved with, landed here in Australia in December 2020, that a lot of the um, amino acids that we find in life were on this asteroid. And this is the big question, where did life and how did life start on this Earth? One theory is that an asteroid crashed into us four billion years ago and gave us that initial spark. So by searching for these things, not only do we can figure out how it all started, but potentially how to defend ourselves as well. Wow, fascinating. And such good pictures there uh, that have been provided as well of the whole process. It's actually very fascinating and to watch it. <laughs> um, let's move on now because three astronauts have returned home after over a year in space, Brad. That's six months longer than planned. 12 months. God, how did they do it? <laughs> yeah, look, most space missions at, on the International Space Station now are six months. We've had a few year-long missions specifically designed and what happened was this was the group of astronauts, so it was an American and two cosmonauts, that when they went up to the International Space Station, their capsule got a leak. Um, so during a spacewalk, they noticed that the capsule was leaking fluid. Um, and this appeared to be a puncture from a piece of space junk. And the problem was, once that fluid was essentially leaked and the line was, was split, the safety and reliability of the capsule coming down was unclear because what happens is you have a capsule that takes you to the space station. It stays attached there both to serve as an emergency capsule if something goes wrong, but also your ride home. With the capsule inoperable, how do you get home? So we saw a few months ago uh, in about April, May, them sending a special capsule just to the space station for them to come home in. But the, that meant they had to de turn their six months into a year. Normally, we like vacations turning double the length. In this case, <laughs> it was a, a an unplanned work trip that forced them the time. And it's kind of a problem because you train and adapt to the mission you're designed to. And there's a lot that happens to the human body with long duration space flight. So when they weren't prepared, there was definitely some surprises that they, they encountered.
during these 370 days. Well, that's it. I mean, 12 months in space, goodness me, the body must have been an absolute shock yes. being up there for um, so long. Brad, let's move on. One of physics' greatest mysteries remains unsolved when it comes to antimatter. What is it? <laughs> so antimatter is a real thing. Um, if you remember back in school, for every action, there's an opposite equal reaction. If you push and their forces repel, in physics, gravity pulls matter, the stuff that makes it me and you and the walls and the cameras, um, it interacts with gravity. And we know antimatter exists. And the problem is when matter hits antimatter, they collide and annihilate each other. Now, that's all well and true. The problem is we're missing a lot of antimatter. If we should have equal amounts of antimatter as normal stuff, um, where is it? We don't know where a lot of this stuff is. One theory always said that maybe it interacts with gravity differently. If gravity pulls us down, maybe antimatter gravity pushes away. So when the universe formed, there was a theory that says maybe we formed a matter universe, essentially our universe, and then there was a complete antimatter universe where there's an anti-program where anti-us are talking on it right now. <laughs> it kind of sounds bizarre world, but this really made sense until discovery that well, this is actually not what happens. Gravity interacts normally with antimatter and it kind of throw that idea out the window. So we're kind of back to the drawing board on where all this stuff is. Gee, it sounds all very complicated. Luckily, we've got people like you who understand the world of physics a lot better than I ever will, uh, Brad. Very interesting. Now, just finally, James Webb, the incredible telescope, has spotted the same supernova exploding three times. So this is cool because, you know, normally you'd think stars only blow up once, and that's usually the case, except in some situations you can have massive amounts of gravity that lends or magnify the light. Um, and you could do this, you know, if you put a hold a glass of water and you have light coming through, you can kind of see the, the light rays moving and bouncing around. You can see this in a pool. Well, this happens in space with gravity. And in this case, the supernova took different paths through space appearing in different spots. Now, what's exciting about having these different um, appearances is they each take a different path through space. By taking a different path through space, we can time and measure its left leaving an arrival, kind of like trains leaving the station. So if we know where it went, we know when it left, and we know when it arrived, we can probe the actual nature of space in between using the exact same object. So it's a really cool technique that I was a part of when we originally found the first one with Hubble. And now that James Webb in only a year has already found one, we hope that many of these across the universe can give us a really unique way of measuring how the universe is growing essentially in real time. James Webb just continues to kick a number of goals. That telescope's right. been incredible. Uh, Brad Tucker, lovely to speak with you as always. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thanks.